recording at this point in time, and we do want to welcome you to Bedford Hanscom for the GA pilot. And here's Andy. If you don't know Andy, you haven't talked to him on the radio. If you fly at Bedford Hanscom, you probably have many times. And Andy and I go way back. We used to do some work together way back with the old New England Aviation Safety Expo. And if you would, Andy, quick thumbnail sketch of your background as an air traffic controller for what? 25 plus years now maybe yeah we'll, we'll just we'll just call it at that we're between 25 and 30 30 we're we're, we're encroaching 30 years here probably pretty soon uh i yeah, can't believe it's yeah. been that long but yeah it's been a i've been a controller uh in the great lakes region as well as out here in new england and have worked at all different kinds of options uh, from uh, boston Cent or i mean the cleveland center to cleveland flight service i was in the detroit area for a little while at, at ypsilanti um moved out here and have worked in manchester when it was the old radar facility and then worked at boston tracon for a little while up there yeah uh, and then been down here for about uh 10 11 years something like that and my my highlight uh, of my career has been the two years that i got to work at oshkosh as a controller the world's busiest air traffic control tower way back in 2000 and 2001. It seems like forever ago. But, and, uh, and what did they call that? Training for Bedford Hanscom? Yes, that is <laughs> yeah, yes, correct. Right. Yes, that was. Yeah. A lot of skills that we use there. You know, I try to teach the guys here to use those as well, too. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's a great environment. If you've ever flown into Oshkosh, I, I, I encourage everyone to at least try it once. So it's yes. Yes, I, I would agree with you there. And I, I've been lucky over the years. I've flown in. The smallest I've flown in is a 172. The largest I've flown in is a Cessna Citation. Yep. Uh, so, yep. You know, and everything in between. So a terrific yep. opportunity. you got to go if you've never been. And yep. if, if you don't know me, that's me in a few different environments. But I'm the FAST Team Program Manager, but also many people just mention it. It's the Flight Proficiency Manager, it seems to be sometimes, because I do some uh, national resource work. And I got to do a little bit of promotion here for you know, the FAA, the WINGS program, and a proficiency program. One of the things that I just ask is we want, if all of us in general aviation can promote, educate, and improve ourselves, and the general aviation community around us will be much, much better off overall. And that's just what I ask safety reps that people like Andy and I deal with all the time. And you know, you probably found out about this from fasafety.gov, which has a lot of terrific um, courses on it. And one of the big things we want to emphasize to you is the WINGS program, is the more proficient a pilot you are, the better off, the safer a pilot you are. And we also do want to mention what can help you, whether you're at Bedford Hanscom or any towered controlled type airports around, is the opportunity to learn more about the air traffic system. You know, kind of the air traffic controllers, some of the most important people you'll probably never see. But as a pilot, it's a little bit different now, and you can look it up to find out the details. But um, it started back a few years ago, it was shut down for years, but there is what's known as Operation Rain Check, which is the opportunity for you as a certificated pilot to be able to visit an ATC facility, either by yourself in small groups, it depends upon the ATC facility itself, but a great little thing that maybe, you know, your local airport association or flying club May, may be able to do at your local airport someday, do take a look at Operation Rain Check and being able to do that. Give you a little bit of an idea about Bedford Hanscom, where it's located is, this is the Boston area, the Boston uh, Class Bravo airspace. I almost said TCA there to show in my age, I bit my tongue. <laughs> but uh, really kind of the last, or one of the last of the classic circle uh, class Bravo airspaces that are left out there. Many of them have yeah. been adjusted and changed, but Boston has kind of been this way for a long, long time. And that's Boston Logan Airport located right there in the center of the class Bravo airspace. And just off to the Northwest out here near the split of the shelf from 4,000 feet to 3,000 feet, the floor, 
with the tops at 7,000 is Bedford Hanscom with its associated class Delta airspace around. And it is a compacted area. You know, we have multiple class deltas in the area like Beverly, Lawrence, Nashua, Norwood, along with a lot of kind of busy uh, non-towered airports, you know, Minuteman Stowe, there's the old Marlboro Airport, which is actually now closed, Mansfield, Taunton, Plymouth, um, Marshfield, uh, even Cranland down here, you know, Plum Island. It, it's a busy little airport to give you an overview of what it looks like and where it's located. And you can see it right there. Here's a satellite view to give you a little bit of an idea. Going near it is uh, what we call Route 12895 that stretches around the city with 495 out further. And where Route 3 meets with Route 128 I-95 is pretty darn close to where Bedford Hanscom Airport is located. You'd see it gets pretty busy as you move in to Boston Logan with some of the major highways, uh, the Mass Turnpike, I-90 going inbound. There's Route 2 as that goes into the city, Route 9. You know, this is Interstate 93. This Route 1 as it comes down from the north, just to give you an overview of where the airport is located. And even to give you a little bit different view, this is the same viewpoint, but with a helicopter diagram, because there is a lot of rotorcraft helicopter traffic in the area. And this is from the helicopter chart. It gives you an overview of what the helicopter routes are going into and out of the city of Boston. Also, some other things that it might be a little bit easier because the scale is better is the wildlife areas. around it and then this is just a quick little overview of the airport itself is in general it's a runway 2911 with 523 and we'll talk about and Andy will talk about those a lot more in a little bit and the operator of the airport is Massport which is a large government organization that takes that oversees a lot of transportation uh, stuff in the Boston Massachusetts area and you guys are still open from uh, 7 uh, to 11 local? Yes, that's correct, Steve. Yeah, we open up the, the Class Delta airspace is in effect from 7 o'clock in the morning until uh, 11 o'clock at night. And uh, we, uh, the, after that, the airspace reverts from a Class uh, Delta airspace to a Class Golf airspace, a non-towered airport. Uh, we do have the common traffic advisory frequency that uh, pilots can call in on, which is our tower frequency, and just fly in and call in just like you would going to any other non-towered airport in the airspace. Yeah. And you will find most of the FBOs, there's three major ones in the airport, get started at 6 o'clock in the morning. And we were talking the other day, I, I haven't really seen, uh, it may be a little bit early, but we've had a lot of large construction projects here in the last couple of years at Bedford Hanscom. Uh, I don't recall, Andy, do we have anything kind of scheduled for 2020? No, we don't have anything as far as we're aware of that Massport has scheduled for uh, 2020. They just got done with one of their airport evaluations. And so there was a lot of construction and painting and stuff like that going on to, to bring things uh, make back up to code so that they could do well on their, their airport inspection. Um, the only thing that is in place that we don't have a lot of information on that, that you can stay tuned for is, is Massport is per currently um, conducting a, a geography study of the airport, of the airport layout and, and so on and so forth. And that's when they end up studying um, how the, the different taxiways are defined and, and we, whether or not they need to change any of the directions or angles or the sort of thing. So this has been a big, long three-year study, so we're still waiting to hear back on on what the results are of that particular study. So that's the only thing that's going on right now. That is a good thing to point out too, because uh, our standards for taxiway runway layout changed oh, about five years ago, maybe even a little bit more than that now. And Bedford Hanscom 
because it's such a what I will call a strong reliever airport would be one of the ones on high priority to have upgrades made in the layout of the airport to meet those new standards. Um, you know, if no other construction was going on. So I, I understand why they're doing that because it probably, unless it, for some reason it was already on the list for like a whole brand new runway, it will be one of the first airports probably to get the upgrade to those standards. So. Yeah, that's correct. You know, upgrade to the standards as well as we also look at the opportunity for whether or not it would decrease any um, runway incursions uh, yes. that yeah. have, a, have a happened and occurred considering that, you know, I'm on part of the runway safety team as well, too. That's why we're looking at that for yeah. make sure that we don't have the, that we do a good job here of, of making sure the runway incursions don't don't happen, but we just want to make things as, as safe as possible and we re, we reevaluate that that uh, those contingencies on a year to year to year basis at our annual team meeting. Yeah. And you know, what is really great and unique about Bedford Hanscom is the variety of aircraft, you know, there's, oh, I have to go back and count, but there's few larger flight schools located right on the airport. It's probably the busiest airport we have in the Boston FISDO for training. I, I would suspect, you know, and here's some of the aircraft that you'll see operating in and out of there on basically an almost daily basis. Also, we have a lot of rotorcraft. Not only we got training rotorcraft, but Boston Med Flight is based there. And then this is the other thing that you don't realize, but Bedford Hanscom is different in that it is an active Air Force base co-located with a civilian airport. So, you know, you end up getting MH-60s like this in and out of there all the time in relation to, you know, maybe something going in and out on the Air Force base. You know, and it's a big, big corporate aircraft, also cargo operations and also in the past, although we don't have any right now, but there have been what I would call, for lack of a better way to put it is, smaller commuter type operations that go into and out of the airport. Um, off and on over the years, that has been the case where smaller airlines have tried to make a go of, you know, say going Bedford Hanscom to New York, just to avoid all the ground traffic into and out of the city of Boston. And then other type of things, you know, you have a lot of turbine aircraft, everything from small Eclipse jets for Global Expresses. And I mean, I see this aircraft in and out of there all the time because it's a major airport used by the sports teams, right? I mean, uh, this time of year, you're probably getting a little bit busier with the sports We're teams. We're busier. Yeah, we have been busier now with, uh, with, the, with the NBA and the NHL um, getting back into their normal season as well as... Uh, NCAA uh, winter and fall sports between football, basketball, you name it. I've even seen a volleyball team come in here uh, and, and play. Uh, they have a chartered aircraft. They come in and, and they'll play one of the local colleges from from somewhere down south. So. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, we want to point out we're talking about the corporate aircraft. And you probably have seen this. Bedford Hanscom is a huge reliever airport. And recently with changes going on over in the international terminal at Boston Logan. One of the major FBOs at Bedford Hanscom also has a base, Signature Aviation, at Boston Logan. And this is kind of their old ramp, but this area I've outlined in red basically has been taken away due to construction over at Boston Logan. So now we have a lot of corporate operations that would typically go to Logan and stay there are either going to you guys in Hanscom to begin with, or maybe doing a drop in reposition over to Hanscom. You're, you're seeing an increase in corporate traffic? Yes, we've seen the increase in, in uh, slightly in the corporate traffic um, from those dropping off at, um, at Boston Logan and then coming back over here to park the airplane or just in the reverse they've the airplane's been parked over here and then they got to go back over and pick up pick up their passengers and then go from on there uh what you know we, we still can't really quite tell you know how many people are just actually bypassing 
Boston Logan and flying in and out of here instead. But uh, we'll 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 take the, the the corporate traffic. We got we got room to put them, and we got room to put them on the on the runway. So yeah, we have yeah. seen an increase in that. Um, and so if uh, if anybody is on and uh, and they're uh, fly any type of corporate aircraft in and out of in and out of the uh, the airport here, uh, and you're going to Signature, uh, they have a, a limited uh, amount of ramp space that we'll kind of see in here in a couple more slides um, back on the west ramp. And But we've got a, a, a large amount of parking space over on the east ramp as well. So, you know, we, you may think that you're going to, uh, to the Signature FBO flying in, going there, and, and just going to get off the airplane and go into the FBO, but you might end up being having to be taxied over to the east ramp where they meet you with a shuttle bus and then they'll they'll take you in the shuttle bus back over to the FBO so yep. um, that's that's our that's kind of a little bit of our new uh, new pickup in in traffic here at, at the airport uh, in the last uh, uh, I guess basically maybe in about the last month the last 30 days since that went yeah. into effect so yeah, had not had not even thought of that, but I, that makes sense because their hangar is over on the east ramp, and uh, there's a lot more space over there. And you know, a lot of airports you'll see the kind of a lot of the type of traffic we've talked about, but Bedford Hanscom is unique in that you see some things that you'll just never see anywhere else. You know, these this aircraft is based there, does some testing. Uh, you know, military aircraft. I. I don't know if I have it in tonight's presentation, but you know, only once in my entire life have I ever seen a Boeing 747 SP, and you can go look that up if you want to. Uh, you know, special performance in the early life of the 747s. Uh, the only place I've ever seen one in my entire life, even though I've been in airports all around the country, was right at Bedford Hanscom. You know, I walked out of the hangar one day doing a check ride and was like, really? <laughs> As it was sitting out there on the east ramp right in front. Yep. <laughs> you know, so you do. You, you, it is amazing on the type of aircraft and the type of operations that you'll have to mix in with. And this is uh, just a quick little overview to it. The airport, as I was mentioning, runway 29, runway 11. Two, three, five. The taxiways. We'll talk about that a little bit more, and some other things. The hotspot. We'll talk about more. And uh, this is the current day airport diagram. Just so you do know, is the one thing I'm going to point out right here uh, that Andy was talking about the other day is this is a little bit ahead of its time. Uh, this airport diagram is it shows. U.S. Customs over in the new building with a fire station, and that has not happened as of yet. It could happen any day, but I think as of today, right now, right in that little white notch into the east ramp is where Customs is still located today. Is that not correct, Andy? That's correct. Yep, they're still over there. So you know, you'll get you'll get the taxi instructions to taxi to Customs via Echo Charlie or Echo Bravo or something like that, and you'll. You might question the ground controller because as you're looking at your chart and it says, "Hey, it's over here on the western edge of the East Ramp," and it's like, "No, nope, it's not." You know, they haven't they haven't made the move yet. Um, I uh, just spoke with my manager earlier today too, if he'd heard any updates on when that was going to happen, and we don't we don't have any information yet on uh, on when the uh, on when the customs uh, uh, department is going to is going to switch. Uh, buildings there but the the new firehouse is right is right there in the in the center of the basically in the center of the airport right off the taxiway juliet so that they can they can get uh, they get to any spot on the airport uh, fairly quickly now uh being right there and, and they do have uh three they have now have three three fire trucks over there that that will could be could be responding to uh any emergency that that they deem uh, necessary to respond to Excellent. And here's the information out of the um, chart supplement, uh, what many people know as the airport facilities directory, uh, historically, about runway 1129. It's 7,000, just a little bit over 7,000 feet long, 150 feet wide. Uh, weight limits, if you're flying GA, you probably don't have to worry about that. But if you're in the bigger equipment, you do. If you're curious, this um, PCN, uh, eight, 
82. That's the uh, pavement classification number. It's used for IKO stuff. The F means that it's a, a flexible pavement with low subgrade, unlimited tire pressure, and it's been evaluated by technical evaluation. You have high intensity runway lights available on it. You have Mausers on both ends of the runway with Pappy lights on both ends of the runway. Just you want to be aware, and this will come up later on, that on runway 11, they're off on the left hand side. On runway 29, they're on the right hand side of the runway. Standard three degree glide slopes. And the RVR is basically located over on the west end primarily. Um, you know, it's touched down over kind of by a hill, what's known as the Pine uh, Hill Hangers. And then it's on the rollout on runway 29. So this gives you some overview here, but this is the area down here where the RVR is measured from. And you do want to be aware, uh, it has overrun safety zones on the runway. These are technically not. Um, displaced thresholds in relation to being able to use them for taxi or anything like that. I've watched a couple airplanes try <laughs> in the past. So you want to be aware. Then runway 523, which is uh, painted not with precision runway markings, but is still a plenty long enough runway, although in comparison, it seems shorter, a little bit over 5,100 feet, you know, asphalt grooved, same thing. Couple things just to note, the glide paths are a little bit steeper, 3.75 degrees and 3.5. It doesn't have approach lights, but has runway and identifier lights, and then has VASIs. Uh, you don't see anywhere near as many VASIs as you have seen in the past, uh, visual approach slope indicators, and four bar VASI lights on runway five, they're off on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side to runway two, three. And here you can take a look and you'll see it. it's marked for a non-precision approach runway markings. It has the runway aiming point markings, but it does not have uh, fixed distance markers like runway 11 and 29 have on it. And you can see the intersection of the two runways here. A few different FBOs are available at the airport. This is just very basic stuff. There's jet aviation, uh, which just expanded a year or two ago. Retrix, which is a fairly new FBO and Signature, uh, which is located here. And as Andy was mentioning, they have some parking here, but a lot of the parking they send off to the east ramp as it's getting busier. And a few other airport areas, just taking a look at the airport from above that you want to be aware of is Signature is using the area now, but if you're going into and out of the terminal building, there are these red lines that are used. It's uh, the security area, the CIDA area. And with sports teams and stuff, this area will end up being used and you not allowed in it when it is. Anybody that would need to clear T, um, TSA would, would, would park in that particular spot. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, the the sports teams are all theoretically cleared through through their FBOs. We do have uh, one tenant on the field though that is required to clear TSA prior to them departing and going into uh, Washington, the Washington D.C. Air, airport. So um, those those aircraft will usually be in, in there. But if you're if you're flying with any with any anybody that's out of uh, East Coast or the Aero Club or, or the the flight schools or anybody using the West Ramp. You'll have your designated parking areas, and then the, and the schools and the businesses will brief you on those areas there that you can and cannot go into um, along those along those lines. Yeah, and we were mentioning the east ramp. If you go over there, there is the um, special area for the Air Force, the Air Force ramp, uh, which is marked out in green. What's it has a green solid line that is basically, I've overlaid this dash line on it to make it a little bit more aware. But what you want to think about is a red carpet, you know, and it's not the true red carpet, it's the red carpet painted on the ramp. But the military, if they got uh, military VIPs coming in, this is where they will end up pulling up and parking. And that'll be always a good clue to you if you're asked to go over to the east ramp, you know, um, 
you probably want to give good clearance to that uh, because we're the military VIP. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're protected by people that have some pretty large <laughs> armature. <laughs> yeah. So you, you want to be aware. Now, there is a challenge, and it, it is a factor with a lot of airports out there, but just so you, you do know, and awareness is everything. And I, I know AOPA has been talking about this, and now Signature at least is doing some things to help make pilots that may be flying into and out of using um, their ramp space and getting services from them with it. But um, Massport does have some fees associated with operations for non-based aircraft there. You know, and I, I use the 172 as the example, kind of the typical general aviation aircraft. But if you're three uh, 3,000 pounds or less, you know, for transients, there's a $10 uh, flat rate fee, landing fee um, for that, not much. It gets to be a little bit higher if you're up to 10,000 pounds. You know, it's just a flat rate. It's if you're over 10,000 pounds that they're gonna charge per thousand pounds on the aircraft. There's also, when the tower is closed, uh, the 11 p.m. to seven o'clock in the morning, is it's also an exceptionally noise sensitive airport and it does have some noise abatement procedures you wanna be aware of, but it has a little bit larger fee associated with departures at night. It gets significant above 12,500 pounds because that's usually turbine powered aircraft you know, large aircraft that are louder, but just for like a 172, if you're going in and out of there at that time, um, it can be very significant. Uh, I don't know if they still do. I know historically Massport has allowed those fees to be waived if you were doing like a cross country required for certification. Like uh, I know this was 10 years ago, I was dealing with it, uh, but if you were doing like the long night cross country for the commercial type of thing, uh, if you were able to prove to them that's what you were doing on that flight, they would waive those fees. But I don't know if that's still the case. You can go on their website and find out. It is important to recognize that because of noise abatement, if you do it a lot, they're, they're gonna double the fees on you. And then there's also transient parking fees, you know, and that's for up to the first 24 hour period. And like a 172 with 38 foot wingspan, you're talking like 23. So just going in there during the day, you're looking at at least uh, $33 in fees for a transient pilot. That's just something to be aware of. And as I mentioned, it's a very noise sensitive airport. Uh, you guys work the traffic pattern all the time. And you know, at any given moment, you probably have at least five in the pattern, it seems on any good day. <laughs> To me, I don't know. Yeah, yeah right. You know, we we've, we've had as well. Even today, we had you know more than like you know we had up to three aircraft, but we're more trying to mix those three aircraft in with with all the the jets and turboprops that are coming in here. Uh, it's just uh, one right after the other, so that continues to be a, a challenge uh, for for us, uh, especially when we get new new controllers that are uh, brand new and have never done anything like that before. So. You may even see uh, here from time to time one voice talking and all of a sudden a, a, a different voice uh, come back on the frequency and tell you something different and then you hear the original voice come back because we've got we've got a few controllers that are in training here and they're learning uh, how to how to work the airplanes just in and out of here and we do have an instructor who's sitting plugged in right right next to them and has override capabilities just as if you were flying with a flight instructor uh, doing your uh, biannual flight review or any other uh, flight lesson that may be going on. You know, when the instructor says, my airplane, you know, you can you give it up to them and he, the instructor makes the correction. We, we do the same thing here. But with this with this traffic pattern here, this was specifically designed for to eliminate some noise uh, over over the, uh, the U.S. National Park here, the Minuteman uh, National Park. Uh, historical park there uh, where, so that they could continue to uh, conduct uh, their uh, seminars and, and uh, skits and, and reenactments and everything of that and, and hopefully not be too interrupted by the by the, the noise of an airplane going uh, engine going over top of them at the same time so 
we try to make sure you know this is this is a this is a volunteer program but recommended program by all the, the pilots that fly in and out of here into this into that small traffic pattern and it's typically right around you can see the the outline there goes no no probably more than about a mile and a half two three miles away from the airport uh, for two nine they want you or two nine or one one they want you inside uh, the park there just along the edge of uh, the approach end of runway five and, and along the base and then if you go down to if you're in the pattern for five two three uh, well they want you to fly like right over or past the base all the way out there to um, runway or out to route two and then uh, and then before you turn your crosswind and then turn your appropriate downwind and and keep your pattern in over there towards the uh, the approach end of two nine and and then uh, depending on whether or not we, we we give you instructions to extend your downwind or not then there would be where, where you would want to turn your base at so and typically again this is these are these are for no, these are uh, noise abatement procedures um, so when we're on two nine it's typically left traffic if you're on one one it's right traffic if you're on five it's right traffic to keep you over the base and uh, and then if you're on two three, it's left traffic again, to keep you over the base, so that you, so we keep that noise away from those noise sensitive areas that are all around the airport in the in the four towns that, that make up the make up the uh, the geography of the field. So. Yeah, and it is interesting to note it's happening in more and more aircraft or more and more airports across the country. But uh, Bedford Hanscom, you know, it does receive some noise complaints. Uh, noise abatement procedures are a very strong item at the airport, but it does have an activity monitor, you know, that basically is tied in with things similar to flight aware and all of that, where it's tracking. And if they get a noise complaint, they almost, based upon the geographic location and the time, they almost always can tie it directly to a specific N number or aircraft. Uh, that's very common. You know, Boston Logan, almost probably all the mass port based airports have it available, but there's companies that do that. And it it's beneficial and it's also challenging uh, for the pilots because it's beneficial because it helps quell what are inappropriate noise complaints as well. I'm complaining just because I want to complain, even though nobody really flew over me. But when somebody does end up doing something, you know, that makes excessive noise or maybe flying too low or something like that, it gives the airport operator Massport the ability to find out exactly, you know, who it was. So you want to be aware and that's out there. Now we're going to get started, Andy. We're going to have you talking a lot more now because we're going to talk about uh, the tower operations. But there were one or two little things that had popped up, and I hope I don't put you on the spot with it, but um, a couple questions that have crossed my mind and others with there um, is, I probably should have looked it up, and I know I've heard the number before. Off the top of your head, do you know approximately how many annual operations you have at um, Bedford Hanscom? Uh, Good question, right? I'm putting you on the yeah, spot. <laughs> right. you know, it, it, it goes up and it goes down on that. Um, let me do a little bit of, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start to maybe move on here, but let me do a, a little bit of digging and I can I can find what that number was at least up until uh, uh, May uh, for last year. And I can I can give that to you here in just a little bit. But Okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, uh, or maybe when we get into the when we get into the Q and A section here, uh, and and you can we'll kind of take over from that a little bit. We can I'll look into that, but or just kind of keep things rolling here into into the tower operations. Um, yep. What we're gonna kind of be talking about is is uh, some traffic flows that that, in, in, that come in and out of the area. Um, uh, when you're flying into and or out of the airport, we'll talk a little bit more about runways and taxiways and how we how we end up getting there. Um, we typically have uh, have uh, three three controllers. There's usually a minimum of three controllers on um, during a particular shift. That's a morning shift and a night shift, and then we've got a little bit of overlap and stuff like that. So um, we have currently 14. Excuse me, four, 
14 controllers here at the facility. We've got two supervisors and we've got uh, three trainees right now at the facility. So uh, we're, we're typically staffed with about 20 people overall. Um, and we're only open from 7 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. Um, typically, uh, we have you know a ground control uh, position, a tower position, which we call local control. And then we also have, for those of you that have an, uh, an instrument rating, um, we have a clearance delivery uh, position as well, too, <coughs> excuse me, that, uh, that will uh, issue out IFR clearances as well as they're, they're the position that's also responsible for, um, we do, we, we are all uh, LARS, Limited Aviation Weather Reporting Service, we're all LARS, LARS uh, observers, weather observers here at the field and we take our weather observations and that's what generates the METARs um, that uh, that you guys check prior to, I'm sure everybody checks and their, the weather before they, they go out on, on and do their pre-flight and before they head out to flying. And, uh, and so we are the ones that are developing those while we are here. We do have an ASOS equipment in the that's on the field uh, that we have control of in the tower cab. And if something's not right, a sensor's not right, we can augment that to to read the appropriate value of, of what we're of what's actually occurring. Uh, when we close, though, uh, we sign off of that ace, that piece of equipment, that ASOS, and uh, those ops, those those weather observations now become what we call automated uh, weather observations. And we so you'll see the the, the auto right after the the METAR. Uh, BEB METAR sequence there it'll say auto and those those are ones that are taken by the computer so um, so that is our responsibilities also as a flight data clearance delivery specialist as well as issuing out um, the IFR clearances or if you even want to get a, a VFR squat code just to receive flight following from um, Boston Approach uh, flight data clearance delivery you call up those on, on 2185 and, and uh, you can uh, get a, a squat code uh, that uh, that will uh, tag up to receive VFR flight following. It will be it won't will not be a class Bravo clearance, which we might talk about in a little bit later. <coughs> it doesn't allow you to go up climb up into the Bravo, even though you are VFR. You still have to hear those magic words from the radar controller cleared into the Boston class Bravo airspace. Okay. Um, so, but t depending on our staffing, though, um, the ground control position and the clearance delivery position could be combined up uh, with to one controller. So one controller might be working both both uh, frequencies. So there may be times where you not you don't hear somebody talking on the frequency until you decide to talk, but you know somebody else might be talking on the, on the other frequency, and the controller might come back and say. Number one, two, three, four, five. Stand by. Um, you got. Uh, I got another traffic on on the um, on the other frequency. Uh, that maybe, and that happens a lot of sometimes when you, you know you get an aircraft that's reading this reading back this very long clearance, um, IFR clearance, and we want to make sure that they get it all correct. And then somebody calls up on the ground control frequency. Hey, we'd like to taxi out to the runway or taxi back to the ramp, and you might get to stand by in a, in a another aircraft on another frequency or you might be asked to change to the other frequency you know so that we put everybody on the same frequency and we don't have these bleed over um, uh, issues that, that, that may happen and occur with that so um, typically you know uh, depending on staffing we like to keep those positions split but a lot of times uh, especially in the early mornings and late at nights those positions will all be com combined up and, and be worked by the same controller right um, so, Steve, we will move on to our, our next slide there, I guess. Uh, busy times. Well, uh, as Steve has kind of mentioned, you know, with the mix of aircraft we have flying in and out of here, um, can't really define and determine what uh, a busy time of the day is. You know, people ask me, what's the best time for us to go out and do touch and goes and, and so on and so forth, and I say, 
I, I really don't have a good answer for you because because of Hanscom and the way that nature is set up and its proximity to Boston Logan, we uh, Hanscom does not have and will not have any scheduled um, service in and out of the airport. So we don't necessarily know upstairs um, when a busy time of the day is going to be, you know, uh, because of maybe the flight schools want to go out and do touch and goes, or it's the the um, the business charter aircraft are just coming in and out at will. What I can tell you is, is right now we are approaching one of the busiest times of the year for us is over the Thanksgiving holiday uh, where everybody's traveling to go uh, see friends and family and all around the, the world. I just had, a, I had an airplane today go down to St. Thomas. I uh, wish I was on board. Um, uh, but uh, we have them go all over the all over the place. We had flow restrictions right now uh, at high altitudes going down to Florida along J174 uh, and uh, area and uh, flow restrictions going in and out of the New York area as well. If you're going to the Newark, LaGuardia, Teterboro, uh, White Plains, we even had on the on the board today. So you know th those this is a very busy time of year. Everybody's trying to get where they need to go and then guess what happens after the holiday on sunday every uh, monday typically everybody's got to go back to work unfortunately so sunday night is one of our busiest times for aircraft corporate arrivals coming in you know and so when we kind of get an idea these things might be happening um we uh we may end up restricting certain training activities that are that are going on or you want to do maybe touch and goes or, or practice approaches or things of that particular nature. Uh, we, we, we're going to try to accommodate you as best as we can, but if it just gets to be too overwhelming, then then we may have to ask you to make a full stop or to, you know, if you want to do touch and goes, go, go, unfortunately, maybe go try a different airport for maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then you can come back and have all the fun you want after, after all the traffic flows um, get down. Our other busy time, um, that, that, that happens and occurs on a regular basis around here is in February uh, when all of the schools like to go on uh, their, for their winter breaks and everybody likes to either go skiing or they like to go down to Florida. Baseball spring training is starting, uh, that sort of stuff. Everybody likes to go to Disney in February, Walt, you know, Walt Disney World, Universal, Orlando area, all that. So we'll get a bunch of flow restrictions and a lot of corporate traffic coming in and out of um, the airport between the two weeks, uh, the one week that New Hampshire or that, that Massachusetts takes off on on, on uh, winter break for the for school, as well as New Hampshire the following week. So we feel definitely busy during those particular time time frames of the year. Um, kind of already mentioned, you know, with some of the uh, noise abatement stuff for for. Uh, for 1129 and for 523, uh, we like to kind of keep things uh, away from the noise sensitive areas. So uh, for 29, if you're coming in uh, that way, and Steve's moving the dot there around me for a little bit. If you're coming in IFR uh, in, a, in, a, in a pretty heavy jet uh, any, or turbojet or anything of that nature, will be coming in on right traffic for runway 29. Um, and that's because we're and we're, we'll we'll be keeping the touch and go traffic and all the training traffic to the south and left traffic for runway two nine. Um, be about the same for runway two three. We'll move over to that one there for two three. Uh, you'd also be coming in over that direction and then instead of entering in on the downwind, you'd be turning in and be setting up for a base or a long final or something like that for runway two three. Uh, as long as and our traffic pattern again, traffic will be to over to the east side of the airport and left traffic to, again, keep everybody away from those noise sensitive areas. Runway 5 and 11 kind of get to be a little bit more trickier because there's a little less flying time and flying miles so if you're coming in from, from that direction. Uh, it's tough. Uh, sometimes the, the Boston Center and Boston Tracon kind of keeps you guys a little bit higher than you might want to like to be at or expect it to be at. And we we realize and appreciate that it's tough to, to be able to get down like that. Uh, but we 
everybody's doing the best that they can. So, you know, you may be pretty quick uh, coming in, or you may even be, if you're a little bit slower, you may be vectored around in a little bit of a rectangle pattern <clears throat> way out there over over air and 495 route two area. <clears throat> And just to be able to to be set up in and line up uh, on the final for only one one because sometimes a lot of this happens the wind will be there's a there's a sea breeze that's being affected by over Boston and in the airport we're getting a calm wind um, or a little bit of a light breeze out of out of the out of the southeast but you still a loft you're getting you're getting a nice tailwind coming out of the southwest to the northwest that's moving you along and we, we understand it's kind of tough to slow down in that particular aspect. So um, if you need something different uh, and you're not going to be able to make any restrictions or anything that, that, that air traffic may be asking you to do, you know, that the, the best thing to do is just to, to get on the, get on the radio and tell them that that's un you're unable to do that, that we need a different plan or we're able to do something else and they'll, We'll be able to work work a, a different plan out for you at that particular time. Um, five, runway five is the same way. It's it's still a little tricky coming in that end because there's just not a lot of flying flying distance and flying time to get that airplane down and get that airplane slowed up for that landing configuration for for those particular runways. Um, we do have a lot of overflights that go through um, the airspace. From typically north to south, or um, south to north, whatever the, the case of the direction you may be going. Uh, everybody usually trying to head down to the Cape or Nantucket or the islands or somewhere down around that area. So our airspace there is in that little small dotted circle, uh, the Class Delta airspace. It extends up to uh, to 2,600 um, MSL. And if you're looking at the chart there appropriately, we have the Class Bravo shelves at 3,000 and at 4,000. So if you choose to go over it at anywhere in between 3,000 and 2,600, the top of our airspace, um, it's going to be a tight squeeze because there will be aircraft that are, again, being vectored into, into Bedford uh, at uh, 2,000 and 3,000 feet and as well as aircraft that are climbing out of Bedford, uh, climbing to 4,000 feet or higher. Um, and you, there was also, uh, you can see the, the little, the, the big jet uh, depiction right there above your, your pointer there, Steve, that, that jet that's just outside a minute man there. This is, we, we do sit right underneath the, one of the main arrival corridors to uh, Boston Logan. Uh, as they're coming in down uh, on the, the new uh, the new standard uh, arrival routes, uh, they're descending out of flight levels down to like six seven thousand, but you should be well above those. But again, there is a lot of traffic that's that's being that that, that flies between um, Beverly, Nashua, Manchester, Pease, Norwood, comes right over top of uh, right over top of of Bedford. So if, uh, I would suggest that if you don't want to talk to um, Boston Tracon and, and go into the Class Bravo airspace, you can go ahead and call us and ask us for a transition at or, at or below 2,600 uh, in our, that would be in our airspace. If you do choose to talk to Boston Approach and receive flight following through the area, uh, we have a letter of agreement that is in effect with them that uh, they can give you a transponder code and they will they will are allowed to go in through our airspace at 2,500 and above. So that little 100 foot section there between 2,500 and 2,600, they can go right across our airspace and, and not and not call us. So you don't have to worry about um, asking uh, Boston Tracon whether or not you're you're cleared into the class the Bedford class Delta airspace, or you don't have to call us on the tower frequency and ask for permission while you're still receiving flight following. That's all set up. That's all so that so that you know no but not a lot of people have to be on <clears throat> on two different or multiple frequencies asking for the same thing. So that's good to know there. Um, one thing I did want to point out there is a letter to airmen um, 
that is, did we look at this? Is that, the, I believe that's one of our attachments there. Oh yes. no, that's, that, yeah, that, that's the attachment for, um, there is extensive uh, flights that go in and out of Minuteman Airport there, just pretty close to Steve's pointer. Um, so in, in going in all different directions, there is a letter to airmen that has been put out um, to use caution when you're going in and out of the Minuteman area that there are several other flights, IFR flights, VFR flight following, all sorts of stuff that are in that general vicinity and to use caution and to call if you're going to get um, flight following to call Boston approach on frequency 124.4 as, uh, as soon as possible. Um, that letter to airman came out from a, uh, a near miss situation that we had happen a, a few years ago where uh, we actually had uh, a couple airplanes almost literally touch one another. So we had to issue uh, a, a letter to airmen say, hey, use caution, call us early. There's a lot of traffic that's, that's coming in and out of this, this airport. One of the other reasons why that's also, why is there other traffic out there, as I might indicate that um, Steve's on the line there, just north, or on the Victor Airway, just north and south of those lines is where the flight schools like to go out, and uh, those are their practice areas to, you know, when they're doing flight instruction and, and the student pilots are learning their maneuvers and so on and so forth. So they go out there quite frequently um, to do conduct their training. So there's a... Uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of activity that's that's in that northwest corridor out there be from between uh, uh, the, the 30 mile veil and the uh, the uh, 20 20 mile veil ring there of the uh, Boston class Bravo airspace at all yeah. altitudes. And, and again, be advised also if you're coming in IFR um, from the west, you're going to be coming in right there over Steve's. Steve's dot at that airline. There, you're, you're, there's there's going to be jet traffic that's coming in. That's between 5,000 and 10,000. That's basically really coming through there. You know, we even had one guy go out there and try to do some aerobatic maneuvers at one point in time, and we're like, no, that's that's really not the right area <laughs> to be doing that because you know you could become somebody's hood ornament fairly quickly. Yeah. Uh, uh, with oh, with yeah. uh, all the IFR traffic that comes in and out of there. Uh, and you were m mentioning, Andy, that, you know, that you, with practice approaches and stuff in the letter to airmen, you did have out in that area a close call in the past. But, uh, you know, you may not be aware. We actually did have a couple years ago. They were not on with Boston Approach or on with you guys, but were operating out in that area. Somebody basically joining the localizer for practice outside of the class delta airspace without talking to boston approach and uh, then yeah. somebody else transitioning and they ended up playing tag uh they did end up hitting each other thankfully nobody was hurt uh yeah. just bent aluminum but it has happened out in that area right yeah so you know it's best that everybody be definitely aware that uh, you know, we, we used to call it, I don't know how much of it's called so much more, but between like Bedford, Manchester, and Nashua, Pittsburgh area used to kind of be like the Bermuda Triangle, you know, where there's all kinds of activity, you know, uh, that's going on out in, in, in that area. It's a heavy, heavily traveled area to, you know, for general aviation from between all altitudes, uh, all the way up to about 10,000 feet in, yep. in around and and that is picking up more. There used to be a college based up at the Nashua Airport uh, that went defunct for a little while. Another college has recently, in the last year or two, started an aviation program there, and uh, they're just going into their second year. But now more and more students, so there's more and more training aircraft operations taking place up here in this corner. Yeah. Um, practice approaches. Also, we welcome practice approaches uh, when, whenever, whenever uh, the traffic is is, uh, is available. Um, there is a, also a letter to airmen that is put out by Boston Tracon that uh, that gives the frequencies uh, in all the airports in the area that they that they are authorized practice approach instrument practice approaches at. 
and you will receive um, standard uh, IFR service, uh, separation while on the final uh, to whatever approach it is that you're, you're shooting. And that would typically be three miles or four miles or five miles if the weight turbulence is, being, is involved and uh, a minimum of uh, 500 to 1,000 foot vertical separation. Uh, coming in, in and out of in and out of the airport, and that that step separation is maintained until uh, you reach the uh, missed approach point. And then, uh, if you're going to go do a missed approach or a low approach and go back for another one, then uh, then you you revert back to a just a VFR standard VFR aircraft uh, with 500 feet and sep vertical separation and merging target uh, separation. Until again, once you're cleared for the approach and you're set up on the on the final. Um, one of the restrictions that we do have, um, because again we're so close to the Boston uh, Logan Airport, it is if we are uh, if Boston is departing runway 33 uh, left um, over there with all oh, their large large type aircraft. Um, those aircraft are very slow climbing. Usually it's the heavy 747s and the A340s and the A380 has even come in and out of Boston several times. They're pretty slow climbing uh, once they initially get off of the airport. So uh, Boston Tower will restrict and not allow a, like an ILS approach or a, a precision approach into, uh, into runway 29 because that takes the, it takes the aircraft right along the edge of uh, that inner circle there, the six-mile uh, circle around uh, Boston, Boston Logan there, takes you right along the edge of that to be able to get a good, nice turn on for the approach for only two nine. So, typically, if they're on the three-three flow, they will not allow us allow uh, approaches to be conducted to um, to two nine. So you may be offered uh, something to a two-three, or depending, you know. Um, uh, depending on the winds and traffic, we, we, they may suggest that you end up maybe trying another approach someplace else, like up in Lawrence or Nashua or Beverly or something that's close. Norwood has, has a couple instrument approaches. So you may go down there for one or two approaches and then be able to come back and do something else in, into Bedford. Um, all right, so that covers pretty much uh, let's talk about the airspace. Um, as far as again the the uh, airport setup and, and traffic flows on the ground, um, we'll bring up the the airport diagram here. Um, if you're on uh, somewhere down there around the, the the west ramp and you're hangered or parked down there around the west ramp, the uh, South Key hangers, uh, jet aviation, the, the main terminal ramp or signature. And you're coming out to runway 29, and 29 is the active runway. You're typically going to get this Juliet taxiway, Juliet Echo, and come out that way and come all the way up to 29. There is a nice little run up area that's down here that's wide enough for you to go over there and pull off and do your run ups um, and allow other jet traffic to, to pass. It's wide enough out there, you know, you could pretty much. I don't know if you could nowadays put two 737s out there, but you could at least put a 737 and a Falcon jet or something like that that's got like a 70 or 80 knot or foot wingspan as well as the 130 or 100. You know, there's a, the 737 is like a 100 and 117 foot wingspan that you could, could put right there. So, and typically what we you know we would like to do is if you're going to do a run up or something to pull off over to the side there so so that you can let the other traffic get by you um, so that we're not we're not holding up uh, these departures because the jet the, the executive the corporate guys you know they probably may have flow times that they that we need to be able to hit for uh, uh, to go into places so along J174 or the New York area or wherever there's traffic management initiatives in place so. If you're coming off of the east ramp from the customs area or any of those other hangers, other hangers that are there along the east ramp, our typical route is to come out Charlie Echo to come to runway 29. Um, and then uh, that's a pretty simple one there as well. And then if you're coming out of Retrix or Pine Hill, that kind of is a little bit longer taxi for you over there. If you're coming out of uh, the FBO at Retrix, 
this is a little bit little little tricky uh, from some from time to time because um, as you're coming out of there, we there is the appropriate taxiway signs that are right across the that sit right across the taxiway coming out of the ramp. But your your route is generally going to be um, taxiway Mike to cross runway five to join Sierra and then all the way up to Echo. Right? Nice like Steve's pointing out there. Sometimes it may so you're gonna to have to cross that runway. You typically the approach end. Sometimes you you know we've had some pilots get a little confused and they make the left turn out of there. And as long as we catch it in time uh, we can probably end up taking it to all the way up to Taxway Echo, but it's not necessarily the preferred method uh, to be able. So watch your instructions when you when you're if you're coming out of the Retrix ramp um, <clears throat> that we give you, uh, you you turn the you turn the right way uh, and be able to cross the runway at the approach end versus crossing at the midfield point right there. Pine Hill hangers uh, for now. Uh, that uh, again is kind of the same instruction. Although since you're closer to Echo, we'll just take you Mike all the way up to Echo, and then have you cross midfield to go out to runway two nine. Runway two three is a little stickier uh, configuration to try to get you out there too. Again, if you're coming from any of those directions from down on the south side, um, you're going to either get the Sierra or Juliet, depending on where you're coming from. Um, and then you're going to get Echo, and then you're going to get Taxiway Golf, and you may include, may get a hold short instruction, or you definitely, or, or you're going to get a crossing instruction at some point in time. Uh, this is important because it's important to read back your instructions appropriately with your call sign and the hold short instruction. That's one of our requirements that, uh, that we need to make sure that that uh, ensures that you're going to do what we, we we instruct you to do. So, um, Juliet typically the West Ramp Juliet Echo Golf hold short runway two nine, and then we will cross you cross runway two nine at Taxiway Golf. Continue your taxi, and then Massport's been nice enough. But we we did they finally get a, a run up pad put out over there that you can pull in, and we can typically put about four or five small type aircraft. Uh, inside of inside of that run-up pad there for you to conduct your run-ups and, and pre-departure checklists right? so that we're not blocking the tax blocking taxiway golf there and we typically call that golf north you know but that's just a terminology between Massport and and the tower uh, golf north golf south echo west west of runway 523 echo and then echo on the east side so um, that's typically how you get out there between um, from the west side. Again, if you're coming from the east ramp, that might be um, Alpha Bravo Charlie or an entrance of being uh, Steve over here by Alpha Bravo Charlie on the east ramp. Um, or you, there's an entrance right a beam golf right here. You can come right out through the east ramp and go right over over to golf as well too. And I'm going to mention two things um, from kind of the FA perspective and one from the pilot perspective with it is from the FA perspective, I think historically where we've seen the largest number of runway incursions at Bedford Hanscom, it probably has been right here at this Gulf intersection. That that sound about right to you, Andy? Yeah, from what it, you've seen? yeah it, 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 if you ever come up and visit the tower, you can kind of see how kind of scary that looks because, you know, it, it, until, the, until they put air, brake lights on aircraft, um, from on the back, we can't really necessarily tell that you're actually going to hold short or not. We've got the confirmation, but I've even recently had incidents where the pilots have read back everything. They've acknowledged uh, with everything, but uh, they uh, started to cross that that hold short line there uh, without authorization. We just can't quite tell whether or not you're going to slow down and stop there, just because of the angle that we're looking at. At you, we're looking straight at your tail there as you're as you're uh, turning on the taxiway golf. So that that is kind of a con a concern, uh, and it gets gets us a little nervous when we get on this particular type of operation. Yeah, 
And the second thing from a pilot perspective, because I used to go in and out of the east ramp a lot, but you see this um, dark line is that is a very large area of concrete pavement there, but there is only a small spot that does not have taxiway lights on it, as you can see right above the red dot, right across from Gulf. And that's where you end up turning in or coming out of the east ramp. So I would caution you, if you are going in that area at night, even if you do know it, but go slow, take your time. Because, uh, you know, even though I knew it, I always had to sit there and, you know, in a two person crew, we'd be like, Okay, is that it right there? No, nope, here it is. So that that's a challenging area uh, coming into and out of like in the winter this time of year. Yeah. Uh, one last thing to close up uh, two, three, and then I think we'll move along and see if you're coming out of Retrix the area, then that's gonna be the, the westerly flow where we take you up to Mike, hold you short of one one and cross Romeo, all right? Now be advised, Romeo taxiway and November taxiway do not have any taxiway lights on them. So that's a, uh, at your own risk operation during the, during the nighttime operations. We typically won't try to take you out that way during the nighttime, but we might, um, depending on traffic flows and winds and situations and stuff that's going on. But, um, so that's the, that's the, the typical standard route to get to runway two, three from the west side of the field there at the Pine Hill or, or the Retrix area. Um, also note that um, the thing that also we ca caution you on is a lot of times the helicopters are, are doing touch and go, practice touch and goes, they will also be on taxiway Romeo. They'll be in that little traffic pattern there that Steve's pointing out with the pointer. Um, either that's, that's the traffic pattern for a westerly wind or they'll, they'll go in the opposite direction uh, if it's at uh, winds are out of the east uh, for a 1-1 one, one or a 5 configuration. And typically they'll have a restriction to remain north of runway 29 or um, west of runway 523. So if those operations are in effect and it's during the daytime um, as well for runway 23 coming out of that west side, you might get some of those other other uh, routes that might can cross in the approach end, Sierra, Foxtrot, or up to Echo and then across. Right. All right, Steve, I think in the interest of time, we'll probably skip over the lasso stuff. Uh, we can talk about that in a, in a later uh, presentation. Uh, just talked a little bit about the helicopter operations that go in and out of Taxiway Romeo. Um, they also de uh, the, the can depart off of the ramps. Uh, without a, with, without, we do not issue a clearance. We just issue an advisory for the helicopter guys that are coming off the ramps uh, that, that do a lot of sightseeing tours and or training tours and stuff like that. We do have um, the, the Boston Med Flight, which is right back there now over Steve Stott on the far edge of the signature ramp. Um, their operations, you know, where they, they can pretty much lift straight up and then either head south, southeast into the Boston area and follow, pick up one of, one of the two available helicopter routes that go in and out of the Boston area, going to the hospitals back and forth. Um, a lot of times, even though they, they're, they have, MedFlight has bases at a couple other airports around, around New England as well, too, and they may end up needing to go north to a hospital or to an accident scene or something like that. So we'll, need to get them across um, runway 523 or runway 1129 as quickly as possible and then and then proceed on course. If they are in a lifeguard status, which most of the time uh, med flights that fly in and out of here, we're, we're operating them under med flight status, you might get a slight delay in a departure or an arrival because we need to get them on course for, for life-saving reasons. Um, well, some of the other spots that we can also put helicopters on is, is we can also put them on the, on the numbers of a particular runway with a particular restriction. So, if, for instance, example, 1129 is, is operating and is the active runway, and we may have uh, some up operations and some things already going on on Taxiway Romeo. Uh, we can also add the helicopters in to, to do approaches to uh, the numbers of runway 5 or 
give them a restriction like south of Taxway Echo, north of Taxway Mike, so that they can kind of keep doing their thing and be in there a little tight, uh, but be able to keep those operations going as quickly as possible and without any without any undue delays. Uh, talking about hotspot one, we'll go look at the airport chart you know, and some of the things that Steve and I have already been talking about in hotspot one with that big black line there and all those gray areas. You see there's a bunch of gray out there. Taxiway Tango, as well as Taxiway November up to the north, used to be an old runway that joined in with the Air Force ramp back in the back in the early days when, when the Hanscom was a flying was a flying base. And so there's an awful lot of concrete that's out there with the wide runway it used to be a couple hundred feet wide. So even though in that white area in the in the in intersection there of the, the circle of tax, taxiway Sierra, Tango, Juliet, Echo, Foxtrot, and Golf is a lot of old concrete. And so the only thing that we have for markings out there is the appropriate FAA approved um, taxiway signs and lines and painting and marking. But there's also a bunch of concrete that's out there as this um, picture here demonstrates. So it is very somewhat confusing for pilots, especially at night, even when you're coming in, as to which direction you're supposed to turn on. And as you can see in this graphic, Massport does have some in-ground, in-pavement markings that will indicate when you need to turn in order to go down certain taxiways. So that helps us. That's helped us a lot. Our incidents of getting confused pilots, confused pilots in that hotspot area have reduced significantly since they put in those uh, in-ground pavement markings there, and have helped things out quite a bit. And as you can see, if you're trying to pull into the east ramp over there towards the compass rows or de-icing area that they do in the winter time, um, that marking there is, is just you, know, you can be able to follow those lines in and out of there. Uh, Hopefully they're not covered with snow or ice or something like that, which they do do a good job of keeping that removed uh, so that you guys can get in and out of there. Um, that's, a, that's a tremendous area to be able to um, navigate through. And if you're not sure, the best thing to do, again, is just to stop and ask, and, and, uh, and we'll, we'll get you where you need to go uh, appropriately. And, and I fly in and out of there all the time. And I have stopped and asked, okay, you want me on Sierra? Am I at Sierra right now? <laughs> yeah, you I, may go there. on a regular basis and you're still going to get con confused in and out of there depending on, depending on the lights and, the, and, the, and the, the time of day and the sun and everything else that's going in there. What yep. we have yep. done uh, as far as the runway safety team as well too is we have made the, the description um, the same. Uh, on hotspot one, so depending on whether you're using the NACO charts or you're using the JEP charts, um, the uh, description of hotspot one is still is, is the same on both now. It says pilots become confused with the wide expanse of pavement and convergence of numerous taxiways. <coughs> All right, excuse me, I need to grab a quick quick drink here. And it, it has improved in the last couple of years, definitely, as Andy's saying, you know, with the markings on the runway, also the enhanced edge markings have made a big, big difference uh, in relation to it. And my gut is telling me even years ago, like for the east ramp, there wasn't a turn in taxi center stripe, if I recall correctly, which made it a bit more challenging. Yeah. You know, what I, what I do find challenging as a pilot is the classic Sierra Tango taxiways. And then also I try to be very, very careful of Foxtrot and Gulf taxiways. You know, if you're just kind of plugging along thinking you got it. I could easily see a pilot, you know, oops, starting to turn down the wrong taxiway. Right. At night, I should say Massport also does have in there, there is um, green centerline lights that, that are lead in, that are lead in lines. Uh, lined in green. So if you end up kind of getting the or disorientated a little bit, look for those green center lines uh, lights, and they'll they'll guide you in on on to the the right taxiways. 
Um, all right. Uh, I think we can, we've kind of covered everything else there along this. This slide here shows a little bit of the 2, 3, and echo um, uh, cro crossing right there at that intersection. Um, we will use, if, you're, if we're on 1129 configuration, we will use runway 523 a lot as a, as a turn off. Um, and that, that's your instruction. Turn left on, left or right on to runway two, three, and then contact ground point seven. Um, that's fine, you know, and, and that's fine. Uh, and you're allowed to, to turn on to that particular runway um, if instructed by an air traffic controller. Uh, the aim also says that you know, as, as when, once upon landing, you'd be able to turn off onto the first available taxiway without instruction. So. That would be, you know, to continue past the, the intersection and then turn at the end of runway 29 on the taxiway Mike. Or if you're landing the other way on 1-1, one, one to, to, you can turn on Foxtrot uh, or uh, without, without uh, prior instruction. But in order to turn on to another runway, you need an instruction from an air traffic controller to be able to do that. Now, depending on the operator, depending on the pilot, you know, oh, we don't maybe like to, to turn on to a, a runway um, just because, you know, there may be an opportunity for another airplane to be on that particular runway. So, um, so what a lot, a lot of times they will do is, is turn on to runway two, three, and then continue taxi, and then turn left or right on to echo because it's the first available taxi. If we're telling you to turn on to that particular runway, we've already cleared that with the ground controller, and the ground controller is already expecting that uh, to happen. So we want you to pull past the hold short line, which is right, right there, just about right there. Pull, pull, pull past that hold short line. You can then stop and do your uh, after landing checklist, and then call ground control. Uh, for further instructions to taxi inbound to the ramp, which would either be a, a left left turn or right turn on the taxiway echo, or if you're going all the way down to the, the southern end of the airport, then we may even just have you taxi on the runway itself all the way to the end of runway two, three, and then turn left or right on the taxiway mic and end up uh, at your destination. Okay. Um, I think Steve will skip uh, the next slide and just kind of move into wake turbulence. Um, We've, uh, there's a, there, as, you, as you've probably kind of picked up with Steve and I talking here with all the different types of aircraft that are flying in, in and out of Hanscom Airport, uh, wake turbulence is a, is a major issue. So you still need to be aware of all of your wake turbulence guidelines for flying in and out of, in and out of the airport. Um, it is, does still continue to be a factor. Um, there are, as far as, you know, individual events that may occur, some, some aircraft have, have gotten caught in a little bit of wake turbulence. Some of them have, have mitigated it appropriately. Um, it is a, also a, a runway safety issue as well, too, uh, because if you get caught in, in wake turbulence or um, a, a particular wind gust, that may push you off the side of a runway. The FAA is now keeping statistics on how many airplanes actually run off the side of a runway. And it's called a, uh, a runway excursion. Uh, so we we'll wanna keep in mind all your, your rules and guidelines on that. We also have uh, wake turbulence separation rules that we have to implement um, for different weight categories of aircraft, smalls, um, larges, and, and heavy type aircraft that uh, we typically require, our rules require us to maintain either two minutes or three minutes of wake turbulence separation that's timed. Some of those requirements are waiverable by uh, you as a pilot in command. Some of them are not. Um, sometimes we may even ask you to provide uh, what we call vi pilot applied visual separation between you and the other aircraft that's, that's um, departing the airport in order for you to be able to conduct a touch and go um, stop or a stop and go because either one of those operations, believe it or not, are actually uh, considered in the FAA world an intersection departure. 
So if you were taken off from not the approach end of the runway, but from an intersection further on down. So um, we, if we, if you're unable to maintain that visual separation from the departing aircraft, depending on the position of where you're at, and you're unable to see them, or the timing is just isn't working out appropriately, you may be asked to go around or to make a full stop landing on that. So keep in mind the wake turbulence. It does happen here on a regular basis. All right, we talked a little bit about the overruns. Steve mentioned a little bit about that. They are for that particular purpose. They're not to be used for um, uh, displaced threshold operations or any kind of taxi operations. Uh, they are marked there with the chevrons. Uh, the other important thing to know about um, the overruns in that particular area, too, uh, on, uh, at least on this runway configuration, is there's the literally physical sets of approach lights that are stuck in the ground and, and coming out of the ground that are leading leading up to the approach end of the runway 29 there on, on the ILS. So, again, I encourage you to review and become familiar with your airport markings. Uh, and signage. Uh, if you uh, if you need some of that material, you can always get in touch with us here at the tower, or through the Office of Runway Safety, or through the FISDO office. Um, they have uh, we have all kinds of handouts on what the airport markings and signage should look like, and, and I'll um, take up and, and keep that in your in your uh, in your flight bag in case the, the, the time should present itself. All right, Steve, uh, let's go ahead and start talking about a more recent topic that's come up in the last year that the FAA is starting to, to track, and that's uh, wrong runway alignments. And Steve will give you here a little bit of an introduction on on uh, what that's uh, been encompassing and what it looks like from the, from the FISDO side of the world. Yeah, we, we definitely have seen it. Uh, probably one of the more prominent locations that has been happening in all of the New England area, and probably even more so uh, across the country, has been Bedford-Hanscombe, where we have had more and more people lining up for uh, the incorrect runway. Uh, you know, basically maybe lining up for runway 23 when they were given a clearance to runway 29 or something like that. A few suggestions, which I know, like the notice that's in the handouts and stuff, gives you a little bit of information. And probably here at the Boston Fast Team, we'll probably be doing a future webinar on it in a broad-based sense on some of the techniques that you can use. But here's one example, and this is just uh, in relation to it. This was one of the more scarier ones, and I didn't even realize it. But, you know, when it happened, pilot inbound for runway 29. Um, Coming in, and if I recall correctly, Andy, you may remember the details of this even better than I do. Uh, yeah, this particular that, one, I can go ahead and take care of that, and you can just use your pointer there as well, too. Yeah. This particular incident was happening very early in the morning, about 8 o'clock in the morning. There wasn't a lot going on at the airport. Um, we had had, um, this was the, uh, there were two air inbounds to the, to the field. There was this guy coming in, it was VFR. And then we had a, uh, another instrument IFR aircraft that was coming in. in typically, instead of coming in on the right downwind for runway 29, he was coming in on the left downwind for runway 29 because we had an IFR jet that was getting ready to depart runway 5, going straight out runway 5, right? So um, the instruction was for the, the, this particular aircraft that's up here with all the dots on it to enter onto the right base for runway 29 because traffic was going to be departing on runway 5. <clears throat> what ended up happening was, is again, is the, the pilot got confused and into a little bit of his orientation, and instead of lining up onto runway 29 for the right base entry, he ended up lining up on final for runway 23, all right, and continued down to runway 23 uh, until, you know, we had, uh, there was an aircraft that was cleared for takeoff on this particular runway, and prior to him going out onto the runway, 
he called us back and said, hey, what's this guy doing? And uh, it looks like he's landing in the opposite direction. And so we were able to catch that in time uh, and maneuver him back around so that he did not land on to runway 23 with somebody taking off on runway 29. That's why it ended up probably being one of the most scariest situations. Typically, we've been catching these up fairly, fairly uh, early, and we've done a real good job of doing that because, like our slide said, we've had at least, well, we're probably up to 15 of these for the uh, similar situations like this since the beginning of this year. So that's in 2019, you know, and yeah. some of the some of the reasons why, you know, we, that these things are kind of occurring here is, is we, you know, pilots are becoming fatigued. You know, one, one of them was on a, was on a long all day flight from the Bahamas and, and lined up on the wrong runway. Some people have just been unfamiliar with the airport, fly, flying in and out of the airport. They've been a mix of both jet aircraft as well as prop aircraft. So we have corporate aircraft, guys that are flying with lots of time, lots of experience, still ending up doing this. As well as the local, even the local guys, even though you think that you might be lining up for the right runway here, uh, you can get one. Maybe you want to double check that uh, to make sure that you know. And we make sure that we put we put that on the ATIS. Make sure that your your heading bug is 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 accurately aligned to the to the correct runway upon turning final. Um, you know, and these are, these are occurring at daytime as well as nighttime. You know, you can you can see in that particular slide there. There was some, those are all the different points around. The, the airspace where uh, pilots have been getting confused and lining up on the, the, the wrong the wrong runway at, uh, at that point in time. So um, seven out of ten of these were in an IFR environment and were transitioning from the IMC case to a visual case. So they were on the visual approaches as we, we tend to say. Most of them have also been on. Uh, I can see there eight out of ten of them have been involving the run when we're on a runway configuration of either runway 23, 29, or both, 23 and 29. Uh, Steve mentioned we have a handout there now that is attached that is, we put out a letter to airmen that is describing the situation to be able to use caution with that, uh, as well as, uh, Steve, you can talk about your, your FAST team notice there. Yeah, for the pilots, a FAST team notice was sent out to everybody and you know one of the questions i get all the time now is we or when i say we more you guys andy what well, starting back in may i think you started putting it on the atis yeah uh, that was cautionary. Right. Yep. yeah yep. you know and, and the fast team notice has some of these tips which you may want to take a look at and it, it really has caught the attention uh i know just a few weeks ago uh we had the office of runway safety was out there uh, doing actually some filming with it, you know, some of the things that we can do is have, please do listen to the ATIS, the entire um, ATIS, because we've had a couple circumstances where people are just grabbing the numbers or pulling information off of ADSB weather and, you know, using all available resources. I mean, I know I put, I threw this in quick when we were in the middle of a meeting on this issue and i use four flight in my flying and i'm like okay how what's a way that we can try to reach out to more pilots and and that's what it is is we want the word to get out so if you fly in and out make sure you share this information with other pilots going into and out of bedford you know and so much so it it is developing i can take a moment here to share with you it'll um play in a different window, but here's just a quick little overview video that the Office of Runway Safety has put together. This is their draft version of it. It's just about um, one and a Bedford Hanscom Airport has the standard class uh, Delta arrival long procedures long. as any other airport, but there are a few things to be aware of, especially if you are arriving from the north for runways 23 and 29. Runways 23 and 29 may look very similar from base to final, and we want you to be aware of this. This is what runway 23 looks like from base to final. And this 
is what runway 29 looks like on downwind. From a quick glance, this can easily be confused for runway 29, but it is actually runway 23. Here is what to look for. Runway 23 has runway end identifier lights and a VASI on the right, as well as two taxiways in a V-shape from the end. Runway 29 it has a 2400 foot medium intensity approach lighting system with runway alignment indicator lights, a PAPI on the right side, and only one taxiway perpendicular from the left. Pay close attention when arriving at Bedford Hanscom. Make sure you are lined up with the correct surface, and if in doubt, don't be afraid to ask. We are here for you and your safety. You know, and probably what we do have happening uh, with this is people that are ending up just grabbing what they see as the piece of pavement, you know, and, and using that type of information very quickly, you know, jumping for the runway. They see the piece of pavement and they're, oh, that must be the runway. And it's not. Uh, we're right here near the end for tonight. Um, but there are a few other things that from the FISDO side, I just want to make you aware of if you are flying into and out of the Bedford Hanscom Airport and some of the things around the area. Uh, we do have some TFRs associated with stadiums. Actually, thankfully, believe it or not, this past bud budget year, fiscal year for the FAA was the one time we didn't have any TFR bus. Uh, we used to have a lot, <laughs> 30 plus a year with the presidential TFRs and stuff. but we have stadiums that are located around the area is we have Fenway and uh, uh, Boston College, but probably even bigger one is down by the New England Patriots, Foxborough stadiums. Another thing that we'll get is occasionally we'll get people trying to follow the helicopter routes on fixed wing aircraft. And ATC is not responsible for assuring that you know, the aircraft meets the regulations. So we have numerous circumstances where someone may end up going down in a Cessna or a Piper or something and ends up violating minimum safe altitude rules as they fly down in Boston with it. You know, we've mentioned some of the other airspace areas around. Uh, there's the restricted area 4102 A and B you want to be careful of especially if you're going around the Bedford Hanscom Airport. I know I hate to say somebody, a professional pilot we know, ended up violating this yesterday and called us here at the FAA and said, I made a mistake. I'm sorry, I really am. But, you know, inadvertently flew through that restricted area as it was active yesterday. So you want to be careful and cautious about that too. So, you know, we're right here at about the hour and a half point. We're gonna go ahead and close it out here, but we wanna thank you for helping us and joining us this evening. We'll take some time to answer some questions here in just a minute, but you know, you are an essential part to being a safe pilot and being involved and taking the time to learn things about what you're doing in your flying and learn more about Bedford Hanscom. All I can ask, is please, please, please invite someone else. You know, we have this available. If you wanna see more or a copy of this in about a week or two, it'll be available online on the Boston Fast Team YouTube channel. And you can find out some different things. A lot of, we do a lot of recordings of these webinars um, and end up putting them up. You can see this, this one will be available for you there also. So you can point it out to your friends or fellow pilots. And, you know, from the Boston FISDO and probably more so, you know, from the Bedford Hanscom Tower located right there, this is the east ramp. You can see the 737 parked out there. Even, uh, you know, we want to thank you for joining us tonight. We really do appreciate it. Yeah, I definitely want to thank everybody for, for uh, chiming in. Um, I just want to end with a, with one other thing here that that I, we received a, a nice letter uh, for our service oh, from one of our local pilots here recently that was dated October 26 of 2019, 
It says, Dear Bedford Tower, on each and every flight, I marvel at the incredible skill and patience you display in keeping every flight safely sequenced and separated. The great disparity in aircraft type, speed, and mission make this even more amazing. To top it all off, you work with pilots of such varying skill levels from the most skilled military jet and copter pilots to amateurs like me. All the while, you guide and teach so that every pilot's skill is improved from flying under your expert guidance. Thanks for everything. So we really do take that to heart. We, 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 we strive hard to, to do a good job to get everybody in and do everything that, 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 that they want to get done and keep the airspace moving safely as possible. So I appreciate um, everybody uh, logging in tonight and, and listening to me uh, with uh, uh, come to the end of probably my voice because I've been talking to airplanes all day as well, too. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, 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 we're, we're here to serve you, you guys. And, and if you, you understand what's going on on our side, then, uh, then it, it helps the system move uh, a lot a lot better and keep everybody safer so thank you to steve thank you uh to everybody uh logging in uh we'll take some questions here um i did find out our total office is uh, somewhere between 120 to 130